<laughs> All right, I'll tell you a story. We're waiting for Ryan from the Heights here, right? People always ask me about my favorite interviews. And uh, one of them was about two years ago with Yogi Berra, the philosopher king of baseball and life. And you can't believe it when you sit there and start talking to him. All the things that you hear that they say he said, like, when it comes to a fork, take it. <laughs> and, and so I, I started asking his friend, I, I said, did he really say these things? He said, it's worse than you think. He went into a pizzeria one time, and the waiter said, Yogi, what would you like? He said, a pizza. He said, you want that cut in six or eight slices? And Yogi said, six, I can't eat eight. <laughs> so I said to Whitey Ford, I said, Whitey Ford, did Yogi Berra really say all these things? He said, it's worse than you think. We were playing the Chicago White Sox one night. And uh, Whitey Ford had been out the night before with Mickey Mantle, didn't have his stuff. First pitch, Nellie Fox, single right field. How are you? Proven moderator. I see Started it. Started already. Yeah. And uh, first pitch, Nellie Fox, single the right field. Second pitch, Louis Aparicio, single left field. Third pitch, Ford hit Minnie Minoso. Fourth pitch, Ted Klazuski. Gone. Grand slam home run. Four pitches, four nothing White Sox. Casey Stengel, the Yankee manager, came from behind the dugout. Yogi came from behind home plate and took off his mask. And Casey said, hey, Yogi, does Whitey have his stuff tonight? Yogi said, how the hell did I know? I haven't caught a ball yet. <laughs> so whenever I'm talking to people who want to be in journalism, my first lesson is don't be Yogi Berra. I mean, there are, there are some obvious truths in life. How are you, sir? Good. How are you? Good. Thank you for being with us my tonight. My pleasure. Oh, I can grab you a water from the side. Yeah, I'm going to take my coat off the <laughs> there. You go ahead. Keep going. Fire away. Far away. Well, we're going to start right at the, uh, at the beginning then. A recent Slate column, I guess it was probably about two years ago, said that uh, you know, and I'm quoting, politicians on issues better than they do. Um, walk us through the process start to finish in terms of what it takes to, to prepare for your interviews and putting together Meet the Press. Well, what I learned, um, I actually went to Canisius High School, a Jesuit high school, and John Carroll University, a Jesuit uh, college. And what I found out is that preparation is all. And I'm not the smartest guy in the world, and, but no one's ever going to um, be more prepared than I am. And what you do is you have to learn everything about your guest, what his and her positions are on the issues, where they came from, who they are, how they answer questions. So I watch tapes of their previous interviews. I read their news releases. I read their speeches. And so I anticipate uh, what, in effect, has become their set speech or their spin. Mm -hmm. And so I try to take that away. So I'll say, you know, Governor, I know you say that. Uh, you can preserve the peace, protect Social Security, and cut taxes. That's your stump speech. But I want to be very specific. And then they're, they're already on their heels because they, they realize that they have to be specific and not just parrot their stump speech. And you can't do that just by being a casual observer or showing up in the studio at five minutes to nine and sitting down and having a good old time. I mean, there are people who do that. And it's, you know, hi, Senator, great to have you here. Are you still doing a good job? And uh, I mean, that, that's, I guess, of some value to some people, but it's not what I'm going to be a part of. Right. And I, I think that we, in, uh, who are journalists on the front line, <clears throat> we have a responsibility, a, a responsibility to the public, um, in that people work hard all week long in real jobs. And on Sunday morning, they turn on our TV set with an expectation that I've been preparing and studying and working all week so that they can learn something. And they're not going to know the, the details of Social Security or the latest insurgency in Iraq, but they expect me to. And they want me to hold our leaders accountable, and I, I do my best. Are you frustrated that, that it's come to turn into such a spin zone at times? Sure. Yeah, there are times when you want to you know, lean over and shake people. Uh, there's a, That'd be interesting a Japanese version of Meet the Press, I'm told, that had a, had a needle on the bottom of the screen with an audience, and they would turn it and say, he's lying, you know, and the needle would go back. <laughs> uh, but I, I, I don't know. I don't think that's appropriate. The, the interesting thing is uh, the viewers, the American viewers, voters, are really smart when it comes to sizing people, take, taking people's measure. Uh, when they see a, 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 a you know, soap opera that's over the top or a TV commercial that's over the top, uh, they, they know it. They right. sense it. They feel it. And same too with a politician. So if I ask a politician the same question, I'll say, Senator, you said uh, that you, know, you, you were against this. And he'll say, well, Tim, I really didn't say that. What I wanted to say is, and I'll say, well, you know, that was an interesting answer, but you didn't answer my question. And I ask the same question, and he dodges it again. 
by then people at home are saying, forget it. Right. Who needs this? And I don't have to shake him. He's already, he's already exposed himself. And I've been on programs where the politician will leave the studio get it, giving high fives to their staff, thinking, boy, we spun the right way out of that one. And the next day, I'll get a thousand emails saying, what a donkey, mm -hmm. and, and it, or, or what an elephant, bipartisan. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I wrote a book about my dad, Big Russ, and um, he is someone who, he left high school uh, go, when he was 18, 19 years old to go fight World War II, and um, never had a chance to finish high school, much less college or anything else. But he has a, an intelligence and a grounding and a common sense that's uncluttered by formal education. And he can detect th people and situations better than he is, he is the cheapest and most accurate focus group anyone could ever dream of. <laughs> and his most deadly commentary will be, the guy's a phony. <laughs> if Big Russ says you're a phony, it is over. So you have, to pass, you have to pass the Big Russ test then. Oh, man, I'll tell you. I, <clears throat> one time I had um, David Duke on, who uh, was the Republican nominee for governor of Louisiana. Mm -hmm. He actually won the primary. And he was, wore a big swastika on his shoulder. Uh, his, uh, shoulder. And he was a, an avowed Nazi. And I said to him, what was it about the United States of America that made you want to be a Nazi? And he said, well, you know, I'm, I, that's long ago, and I want to move beyond that. I want to be a governor for economic development. And I said, well, wait a minute. You were a Nazi. And what was it about the United States of America that made you want? Oh, I don't want to talk about it. I want to talk about economic development. I said, okay, fine. Who are the three biggest employers in the state of Louisiana? Silence. And it was over. I knew it. I mean, I just knew the campaign was over because here he is, the, wanting to be governor. He can't name the largest employers. But I was so into the interview because of the swastika and everything else. I said, give me two. <laughs> How about one, Nazi? Let's go. <laughs> so somebody called me to meet the press and said, you know, you got to be careful. You're a moderator, a, not a prosecutor. And you got to, I said, you think I crossed the line? He said, well, watch the tape. So I watched the tape and so I called home and Big Russ answered the phone. I said, hey, Dad. He goes, oh, man, that was great. You beat that. <laughs> I said, no, Dad, no. I, you know, I got to be careful. I said, I, you know, I know the way you feel personally about these things, but I, my job is to be fair, even if I don't ag agree with someone's philosophy or ideology. Or, he said, what are you saying? I said, well, someone suggested I maybe cross the line from being a questioner to a prosecutor. Are they saying you made a mistake? I said, well, yeah. This one observer said I, I made a mistake. Well, I'll tell you what, you make a mistake, make a mistake with a Nazi. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Good advice. Uh, at the same time, Meet the Press has really become part of the political landscape, I think it's fair to say, of the country. I know uh, Television Week once wrote, anyone who wants to run for president or challenge a president, float an idea or kill an idea, to find themselves or defend themselves must, repeat, must go head to head with Mr. Russert. Are you surprised that, well, for a long time now, it's one of the longest running shows on television, that it's become so ingrained in, into it's, the it's, whole political... It's, it's amazing. Most TV shows last uh, 13, 14 weeks, you know, and they're canceled. Meet the Press is 58 years old this month. Uh, it's 60 years old if you count two years on, was on radio before mm -hmm. television was around. And um, there's nothing like it, nothing even close. I think the Today Show has been on 50 years. It's interesting with guests because there are many times I will want a guest and they, I, they won't go on. I, I wanted Tom DeLay last week and for some reason he wouldn't come on. So. Um, Funny how that works. Yeah. Other times, you know, there are people calling up saying, can I please come on? And you don't have any interest in having him on because they just have some Billy introduce things like that. In politics, in the campaigns, people will try to avoid the program sometimes because they don't want to be pinned down. And then it becomes to a point where they're perceived as ducking. And I, and I have a simple view of that. I don't think you can make tough decisions unless you can answer tough questions. Mm -hmm. I think every president has to make tough decisions. And the only way to get a president to focus is by forcing closure. Are you gonna support this social security change? Are you gonna support tr more troops or less troops in Iraq? Uh, who are you gonna select for the Supreme Court? You gotta make decisions. I had Ross Perot on in 1992, and it was in the middle of the presidential campaign. He was ahead of George Herbert Walker Bush and Bill Clinton in the polls in May of 92. And I said, uh, Mr. Perot, you have brought to the public's attention the deficit with your charts. You said it's $400 billion. And that's a noble effort, and you've succeeded. 
But now I'd like to ask you, as candidate for president, the solution. How are you going to balance the budget? And he said, now then, if you told me you were going to ask me these kind of questions, I wouldn't be on your program. I said, Mr. Pro, you're running for president of the United States. You've identified the problem, but you have an obligation as a candidate to offer a solution. And he was furious. We went to a commercial break. He took his microphone off and came and stood next to me, so eye to eye. He said, he said, I hope you think you proved your manhood. I said, there's nothing to do with manhood. I mean, we're, talking, we're talking about budgets. And so after the show was over, I had to get on a shuttle flight to go from Washington to uh, New York. And the flight attendant ran down the aisle. She said, that interview with Ross Perot was unbelievable. What do you think of Ross Perot? I said, ma'am, I, I never comment about my guests or their performance on Meet the Press, but I am endlessly curious as a viewer, as a voter, as a flight attendant. What, what do you think of Ross Perot? She paused. He said, he, he strikes me as the kind of guy that would never return his trade table to the upright position. <laughs> <laughs> That's smart. That's really smart. That, that appearance sort of uh, put an end to his, his discussion he, with the he media for he, a while. he withdrew from the race. And, uh, and then he came back uh, about three or four months later with a plan to balance the budget, written by John White, an official at Xerox. And it's still a credible plan. And he, I mean, he learned from, from, I think, that lesson, that exercise. He got 19% of the vote. One out of five Americans who voted voted for Ross Perot. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty sizable for uh, an independent candidate. Do you have a, a favorite interview? Other there's a few memorable experiences, I'm sure, but anything that was really, you would identify as the top? Perot, um, Cheney uh, at Camp David uh, uh, three or four days after December, uh, September 11th. Because it was the first time that the country heard in detail from either the president or vice president about what had gone on that day. And I asked uh, Vice President Cheney what the toughest decision he had to make was on September 11th. And he said it was actually a recommendation. He said we had concluded that there were still planes in the air that had not order taken the order to go down. And we thought they were going to strike the White House or the Capitol. And I recommended to the president that the uh, United States military shoot down civilian aircraft. I almost went back in my chair, I was like, God. And I later learned that there was a thought that Flight 93, which crashed in Shanksville, Pennsylvania, we now know because of the heroes on board, um, men and women, students, flight attendants, boiled hot water, rushed the, the cockpit, threw scalding water in the terrorist eyes and forced the plane in the ground because it was heading for the Capitol of the White mm -hmm. House. But for a short period, many people in the White House thought that perhaps it had been shot down by, by our own fighter jets. And that one was, uh, I mean, that was an extraordinary hour because the whole country watched. And we got so many phone calls and emails, NBC repeated it two or three times throughout the day because they just were, at that time, for, uh, you, we were, many of you were starting a school in high school and some probably even here. And uh, people were just absolutely uh, in need for any kind of information. And then, obviously, Bill Clinton and George Bush in the Oval Office. Anytime you interview a president in the Oval Office, it, you, can, it, it, you can hear the wire, AP wires going off, making right. news around the world. <clears throat> Bush, uh, Bush saying for the first time that uh, he acknowledged that there probably weren't weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. Clinton issuing a warning to Korea that they would not be allowed to build a nuclear bomb. Um, and then one other one with Cheney, uh, three days before the war in Iraq, when he said, we will be greeted as liberators. And I said, Mr. Vice President, what if you're wrong? What if there's a long, bloody insurrection and, um, in Iraq? And he said, that won't happen. We'll be greeted as liberators. And I've saved that tape, because it's the kind of thing I like to revisit. You know? <laughs> uh, and then, of course, the, the odd, famous odd couple, Democrat James Carville, Republican Mary Madeline. <laughs> and they tell a very, I mean, they, you know, they have two kids, so they obviously get along occasionally, but the, uh, <laughs> uh, but man, I'll tell you, one time they were, they finished their, um, uh, the, the red light on the camera went off, meaning the program was over, and their conversation continued in the hallway, in the parking lot, I saw the car, fly. so I, you know, I called them the next day, I said, you know, politics and TV are one thing, but marriage is much more important, are you guys okay? James, let me tell you about when I was so furious at my wife, I put the pedal to the metal and the police officer pulled me over and I said, officer, I'm a law-abiding citizen for the state of Louisiana, temporarily residing here in the nation's capital. And I, he said, 40 and a 25, sir, license and registration. He said, officer, I would never violate a law here. 40 and a 25, license and registration. Officer, you don't seem to understand. Mary leaned over and said, officer, 
He's a Democrat, he's lying. <laughs> James insists, he said, woman, what is wrong with you? My, law, my lawful wedded wife to heaven, the whole richer for poor. How could you possibly say such a thing to a police officer? What guy? The police officer said, ma'am, did your husband always talk to you this way on a Sunday morning? <laughs> Mary smiled and said, only when he's been drinking, officer. <laughs> <laughs> Boom! Ouch. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> You entered journalism from politics yeah, at first. Yeah, different path. First with Senator Moynihan and then with uh, Mario Cuomo from our home state. Has that given you a different perspective on journalism or maybe given you better grounding for being a political reporter? Uh, it has for me. Uh, I was 20-some years ago now. Um, actually, my first job was in journalism. I, in seventh grade, uh, St. <laughs> Bonaventure, Sister Mary Lucille, the classroom about this size, and... Uh, she emptied out the class and said, Timothy, come here. And I said, yes, sister. She said, we need to find a vehicle to channel your excessive energy. <laughs> well, I knew I was in trouble. And she said, I have an idea. I'm going to start a school newspaper. And you're the editor, the publisher, the salesman, the mimeographer, the whole. And I fell in love with it. And we wrote a special edition when President Kennedy was assassinated. And I sent copies to President Johnson and Mrs. Kennedy and Robert Kennedy, the attorney general. And they all sent little note cards back. But I thought, my God, they read it in Washington. It was the first time I ever uh, had any sense of a nexus between South Buffalo and Washington. But it just it absolutely encouraged me to, to, to continue pursuing that. Mm -hmm. And it was because of my work on that paper that I was admitted to Canisius High School, the Jesuit high school, far on the other side, mostly the kids who went there were uh, sons and daughters, sons of doctors and lawyers. And my dad was a sanitation man and a truck driver. And uh, so it was a very different place for me, a different surrounding. And I got very involved in writing there as well. The first day I went to class at Canisius High School, they, we sat down and uh, the Jesuit said, take out a piece of paper and describe what you saw coming into this building today. What? Where's the true false? Where's the multiple choice? You want me to think? <laughs> and now when I walk in any room or go to any new setting or new country, I have a sense of where I am and why I'm there and who's, who else is there, mm -hmm. which is a direct result of that. I also encountered Father John Sturm, the prefect of discipline, who put me against the lockers for some perceived indiscretion. I said, Father, don't you have any mercy? He said, Russert, mercy's for God. I deliver justice. <laughs> so I got a quick dose of accountability, too, don't but it, But that led me to go to college. I then took a year off and taught school, history and English. I majored in political science and minored in English, by the way, which I strongly recommend, those kinds of history, English, liberal arts kind of thing, when I was growing up. But I think now, in terms of being a journalist, find a passion. The interesting thing about our changing world now and the new technology and with the internet and the explosion that we've all seen, if you're a, a biologist or a chemist uh, or an economist, I mean, there's a, there's a need to have you in journalism. Mm -hmm. We need experts because a lot of political reporters like myself will go cover a social security debate and I'll dive into the details, but in the end it's a political debate to me. When in fact you need, you need some real expertise to cut through it all. Uh, particularly on tax cut debates, those kinds of things. So I find your passion, pursue it. You can always learn the skills uh, of camera and technology. Uh, and I, also, and I, I, I think the communication courses are extremely helpful as well because they give you a sense of the tradition of communication and, and rhetoric and some of those kinds of things. But I would balance it. I just wouldn't focus on and think that, you know, I, every time I go to a campus, uh, a lot of kids say, you know, so what do you want to be? They say, well, I want to be an anchor. I said, well, do you want to be a reporter first, you know? Uh, and, and because there's, there's nothing to substitute for being a reporter first. He, uh, and then, then I went to, uh, went to law school. And, and that was extraordinary for me because um, it taught me how to take large amounts of information and distill it into a, a manageable level. What is the issue in, in law school? Mm -hmm. And in, I find the same thing in, in my life as a journalist. I read... You know, papers and magazines and journals and blogs and everything, and I have to distill it. I went to see David Brinkley when I took over Meet the Press, and he had been an icon in television. I said, David, how do you take everything you learn in the course of a week and distill it into one hour on a Sunday morning? Right. He said, it's next to impossible, but what you have to do is show your viewers that this is a subject worth learning more about and, and, and have them develop an interest in it. So they want to pursue it. They want to find out more books and journals and, and magazines and, and, and expert resources. He said, but understand the limits of your profession, the limits of television. He said, think of it this way. If Moses came down from the mountaintop in 2005 
how would television news cover it? And I said, I don't know. He said, Moses came down from the mountaintop today with the Ten Commandments. Here's Sam Donaldson with the three most important. So <laughs> I understand the limits of my profession. Television cannot do it all. But we, can, we have a huge responsibility in saying to people, wake up. This is real. This story is serious. And so what I was able to do after law school, as I was a counsel in the Senate and in a similar position in the governor's office in Albany, I was inside behind, the, behind those big oak doors. And I saw how politicians really played and how they made decisions. And I was amazed because it was so much different than some of the coverage I had seen as to what was really going on. And so I tried to take that knowledge and use it to explain to people in a manageable and understandable way as to what really is politics is all about. I think you get one turn in the door, the, revol the so-called revolving door. I mean, there are some people that they want to be in politics and they want to be commentators, they want to go back to politics, and that's, that's what they are. They're commentators, and, but most of them are ideologues, either liberal or conservative. I've tried to use my experience in government and politics to help people understand I'm a registered independent, I don't take sides, and I have absolutely no interest of going back to politics 20 years from now, like I was 20 years ago. And I think my performance has demonstrated that. So is it relatively easy then for you to put your personal beliefs aside when you're interviewing guests, or do you even, I read once that you said that you review so much for the information that you sometimes confuse yourself and you don't even. Yeah, oh, I, you I, don't mean, even I, know, I know what liberals think, conservatives think, independents think, Democrats, Republicans. I mean, I know both sides, I, I confuse myself. I mean, I don't, you know, I see merits on both sides of the argument. So it's very easy. It's for me, you know, I grew up in, in, in an Irish Catholic neighborhood. When you go in the confessional and it's, it's all there, you know, you just say, boom. You just put it all out there in the most objective way possible. And that's what I sort of see on the set of Meet the Press. I sort of put back the little wall. Okay, here it is, pal. Here's your chance, you know. <laughs> and it's fun and it's interesting. And it's, I'm always trying to, trying to size them up and take their measure and seeing how they're going to answer particular questions. I had Senator Chris Dodd of uh, Connecticut on, and he was just going on and on about the filibuster and how essential it was to have the filibuster and um, in terms of the nuclear option and changing the number of votes you need. To, you need 60 now for cloture to stop the filibuster. Republicans are toying with the idea of making it just a majority vote. And um, he said how awful that was because the filibuster was such a vital weapon to have, for, particularly for a minority party. And I said, I want to show you a quote. And the quote on the board said how the filibuster was outdated and should be done away with. He said, I disagree with that. And who would say a thing like that? And I said, your father. He said, what? I said, yeah, that was your father. He was senator from Connecticut. <laughs> and he froze. And he looked at me, and, I, and I'm, 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 my mind's racing, saying, is this guy going to throw his old man over? And he, he said, my dad was wrong. I said, all right, not bad. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever do that. <laughs> um, switching gears a little bit, to talk a little bit about, about your book, which you talked about before. Did you... Did your dad know a lot about what you were planning on writing, or did you, you know, send him a? Obviously, I would assume he saw it before it, no. you know, it hit it hit the. Uh, no. 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 It was. Um, it was such. It, it is the most rewarding thing I've ever done in my professional life, and I didn't know it when I undertook it. Um, the way it all started is that uh, my son Luke, who's a sophomore here, and I flew to Buffalo, my hometown, and I was getting a journalism award from the American Legion, where my dad had been very involved. And they, <clears throat> they gave me this award, and I just started speaking spontaneously about my dad, how he had left school when he was 18 or 19 years old, and he went over to overseas. He was involved in a terrible plane crash. His B-24 Liberator went down, and he spent six months in a military hospital. Practically died and nearly died. And then he came home and started a second mission. And he and my mom decided they were going to raise four kids, and they were going to educate them so they wouldn't have to do the kind of work that he did. And for 30 years, he had two full-time jobs as a truck driver and a sanitation man. And I began to talk about the lessons he taught me by his example. He doesn't say a lot. And he's a very quiet man, a very humble man. But, but his actions, he would teach me about uh, how to protect yourself against the snow, how to shovel a sidewalk right to the ground so you, it wouldn't get icy and people would slip and fall. Uh, how, how to, if you broke a glass, put it in a cardboard box and tape it so the garbage wouldn't cut their hands. All these practical things which really were lessons of discipline and accountability and respect and loyalty. 
and I began more and more to, to understand those the older I got. And then when you have your own child, you know, the older you get, the smarter your parents seem to get. And then came September 11th, and I knew many people at the World Trade Center, and some at the Pentagon, and I saw those policemen and firemen going up the stairs when people were going down, and they were giving their lives to try to rescue people, the first responders. I, my family is filled with policemen and firemen, people who grew up in that kind of middle-class life. And I think we redefine modern-day heroism. And rather than having just athletes and movie stars and TV journalists and other people who are visible and well-known as the role models for society, uh, I thought if I could write a book about my dad, which affirmed his life and said, this is something special. It is a generation of people that not only won a war, and we were the 12th rated military after Pearl Harbor. The, 12th rated. The fact that we won World War II is a miracle. But Tommy, Jimmy Doolittle and Rosie the Riveter, we galvanized as a country. We sacrificed and we did it. And then came home and built this country, built an education system, a highway system, second to none. And it was all done by these middle class guys without much formal education who did nothing but sacrifice themselves and their lives so that we would have a better life. We stand on their shoulders. And I said, can I capture that? And I wrote about it as, as honestly as I could and told stories, and some of them are very funny. My dad has a, he loves to say, you got to eat. And he'll call you on your birthday at 7 a.m. He'll say, happy birthday. What are you having for dinner? I'll say, dad, and I, just, you know, I, I haven't had breakfast yet. He goes, you got to eat. I said, I know you got to eat. <laughs> and, and so I, I wrote this chapter called, You Got to Eat. And, and so I, I finished the book. And, I got the first one off the presses, and I sat down and wrote the most heartfelt inscription I could think to my dad, and I packaged it up and FedExed it to his house, early special delivery, and I'm looking at the phone, nothing. Day two, <laughs> nothing. Day three, nothing. I said, oh my God, what have I done? So I called him up, I said, Dad, yeah, th did you get the book? Yeah. I said, Dad, your, your picture's on the cover, it's Big Russ, it's you, <laughs> yeah. I said, what do you think? He goes, I'm reading a chapter tonight. I'll let you know. <laughs> and I think of all the egomaniac, self-centered people in Washington who, who go to bookstores and look in the back for their name, you know, and here's this guy got a whole book written about him. So I, finally, I, a week later, I call him up. He said, you made a mistake. I said, I made a mistake. I said, I, did. I checked everything five times. You made a mistake, that thing about you got to eat. I said, you say that all the time. He said, I got that from Dr. Matty Burke. The whole expression is you got to eat if you're going to drink. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll fix it. <laughs> but it, um, it, cha it changed my life, and it changed his, um, it changed our relationship in that it almost, it, it allowed him in his mind, it gave him permission to be much more demonstrative with me and much more vocal. And so where we used to do kind of a formal, hey, take care, he now actually hugs me and tells me he loves me. And it's, it's, it's amazing to see an 82-year-old man go through this incredible transformation. And at the end of the book, I, I wrote a, a note to Luke saying, you know, I wrote this for Grandpa, but after I reread it, I, wrote it, I realized I wrote it just as much for you because all the lessons that my dad taught me, I'm trying very hard to, to pass on. But it's, a, it is, it's different because I grew up in Buffalo and, and, and Luke grew up in Washington and people here are blessed to go to Boston College and have a much different life than certainly I had growing up. But I think the lessons are still very applicable. And I think the central piece, centerpiece is that where you're always, always loved, you're never, never entitled. And there's no sense of entitlement. There shouldn't be. And all those values that my dad really tried to instill are just so alive and well in people's hearts and minds. And, and sometimes I think they get lost because we do think, well, you know, I'm on my road to some fantastic career and I don't have to worry about what happened behind me and below me and to whom much is given, much is expected. And, that, and my dad taught that in a, in a way that was so striking now, as I, I look back, I realize that every day, he, through his actions, he was re teaching and reteaching that same lesson. And I was blessed with the Sisters of Mercy and the Jesuits would say to you, in, you you'll find God in every person. You'll, it's there, it's present. Mm -hmm. And I thought of that most vividly when I went down to New Orleans and just drove through that devastation. I have never seen anything like it. I was at 
uh, World Trade Center a few days after September 11th. But I have never seen anything like what happened in New Orleans. Miles and miles and miles of, of it's like a bad science fiction movie. People have just been vanished and houses and boats and cars torn upside down. People's lives and memories and you can see their photographs and their wedding certificates on the wall. It's just awful. And people sitting on roofs begging for help. And I, and I it was an interesting time for me as a journalist because I thought about covering that situation and covering the war in Iraq. And leading up to the war in Iraq, the only information we could get is what our official leaders told us. So if you have George Bush and Dick Cheney and Colin Powell all saying Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction, you have Bill and Hillary Clinton saying Saddam has weapons of mass destruction, and John Kerry and John Edwards and the French, German, and Russian intelligence agencies who oppose the war saying he has weapons of mass destruction. Hans Blick, the chief inspector of the United Nations, saying he has weapons of mass destruction. No matter how they view the war. And we didn't have access to that other than these official declarations. And then when it turned out there weren't weapons of mass destruction, you search your soul saying, how is there any, any other way we could have gotten to that issue? The hurricanes, we saw the objective reality. I saw people on rooftops. I saw people starving, people dying for water, people watching water rising into their attic. And then I'm on, the, on the television, I'm seeing leaders at the local, state, and federal level saying, everything's fine. Don't overreact. We're in control here. Everything's going to be fine. The, the media is taking this out of proportion. What? And we stayed on the story. And suddenly it came from, you don't play the blame game, don't listen to the media, to the very next day, we accept responsibility. And if you want any doubt as to the, what, what the media was able to do by sp casting our spotlight on that situation, is measure the difference in response by the government to Rita hurricane as opposed to Katrina. And the, it answers your question. Mm -hmm. And I hope we keep getting better and better and better. Uh, the evacuation from Houston of two million people, and now they realize they have to have gas tankers along the road to keep people in supply. Because there is going to be another hurricane, there is going to be another fire, there is going to be a terrible snowstorm, and God forbid there's going to be another terrorist attack. And the reason we have a government, the reason we pay taxes and surrender some rights, and there's a big debate about how, many we should, how much we should surrender, but we do in order to govern ourselves, to have this line between chaos and civility, is because we expect our government to protect us. And it fell down. And our job in the media is to point that out. And now uh, in Iraq, it's the same thing. When you know, the mil I had General uh, Abizade on Sunday, and they, sometimes when you ask questions, they'll say, well, gee, you're being so negative, you're being so critical. General, the president said the exit strategy for Iraq is when the Iraqis stand up, America stands down. And you testified before Congress that there's one Iraqi battalion, 750 Iraqis, who are now combat ready. And there are 130,000 Americans. So if you're going to wait to have 130,000 Iraqis capable yet combat ready, we're going to be there forever. And then he said, well, you know, it depends on the size of the footprint. Maybe the large American force is encouraging the insurgency. I said, well, then where are you going to bring it down or scale it down? Uh, I, I just, I, the, the lessons I think are when there's an objective reality that you can get your hands around, you have to use it as a way to, and, and to, to get answers from official government representatives. And when it's top secret classified information, it is so much more harder, but you've got to keep trying. And um, obviously in, with the Iraq situation, people didn't try hard enough. Mm -hmm. On both ends, Katrina and in Iraq as well, how do you, how would you rate the media's coverage of staying on top of both of those issues? Well, I think Katrina is pretty obvious. I mean, I think uh, I don't. I, I read every public opinion poll, and, and just my sense of watching it, uh, you know, the media did an extraordinary job. I, I do think we have to go back and analyze some of the things that were reported, some levels of violence, and some other things that may have been rumored that were put on as fact. And you have to go back and rot, watch that and learn from your mistakes. I think Iraq. I went back and read inter every interview I did with. President Bush, Vice President Cheney, Rumsfeld, Condi Rice, John Kerry, everybody. And um, the questions, the right questions were asked. How do you know we have weapons, you know, what, what's your evidence? And they would say, we have this, we have this, we have this. 
uh, now when I, when after the fact, some of the classified documents been released, you see some of the caveats that were written in, but we didn't have access to the, 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 the classified documents. A lot of the, the senators did. Mm -hmm. The senators did. They could go up in the room in the Capitol and read that stuff. Uh, and so if you go back to 2002 and realize in, in 2003 leading up to the war, <clears throat> a majority of the Democrats voted in the Senate voted for the war. And in nearly two thirds of representatives of both houses, about 80% of the people were for it because there was an acceptance of the fact that he had weapons of mass destruction. And, uh, and you know, the president says, even though there are no weapons of mass destruction, he'd still do the same thing today. And if you go back to 2003 and say, okay, we're gonna go to war with Iraq, but he doesn't have weapons of mass destruction, I think it'd be a much different debate in Congress and a much different debate with the American people. Mm -hmm. I, I wish I knew a way of getting access to the classified information, you know, and but that's going to create its own problem. <laughs> well, I'm going to segue Good. there um, into the Valerie Plame situation. Yep. And if you could, what do you what do you make of that that situation and uh, where where they're moving with that case? Well, I think it's coming to a rapid conclusion. Um, I just read on the wires today that Carl Carl Rove is going. President's political advisor is going back to the grand jury, I think, for the fourth time, according to the Associated Press. And um, the, the it's a tough issue. I mean, the, the journalists who were subpoenaed, those of us who were subpoenaed, uh, we fought the subpoena and lost. And then you're faced with a situation. I mean, Judith Miller decided that she was going to go to prison, and but then she left prison and agreed to testify mm -hmm. before the grand jury. Um, uh, and in a limited way as to, you can discuss what you said in a conversation or the issue here is does, if, if a source releases you, if a, if, if a source says you're no longer bound by confidentiality, I have signed this waiver, but I'm also telling you personally, you are no longer bound. Uh, and that's going to be an argument in journalism schools for now and for forever. Uh, but if you, if you know for certain, or at least a reasonably prudent man for certain, uh, that the uh, waiver is, is not coerced, that he's doing it voluntarily, it's a whole different issue. Um, so I think now that the prosecutor in the case is looking at all the information and all the data and has to come to a judgment as to whether a crime was committed. Uh, was information given to reporters to uh, just criticize the reputation of Ambassador Joe Wilson and his trip? Or did someone specifically release the identity and occupation of his wife in the CIA? And a prosecutor has to judge both the, the crime and the intent and then decide whether to seek indictment or not. And I think we'll know within a month. That's mm -hmm. my guess. I don't know anything. But it's, uh, uh, this special prosecutor, their special counsel's office has been airtight. That's just a guess. What about um, a federal shield law? Do you, do you support it? Would you support it? I think it's a very good idea. I mean, I, I, you know, many people say, well, gee, why do you rely on anonymous sources? Well, the reason we do is because a lot of people in government uh, or in businesses are afraid to talk because they're afraid of being fired. You know, Mark felt deep throat with an anonymous source. And uh, it's so much fun because they have, you know, you, you got, when you go back about deep throat, I had Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein on and they would communicate with Deep Throat by putting a red flag on the back of his apartment building and circling page A20 of the New York Times. And some of my son's kids, friends were saying, well, why didn't they send him an email or call him on the cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> it didn't exist, you know? Uh, but it, we live off anonymous sources because they give us information. Now, can you be used and manipulated? Of course. I get calls all the time saying, let me tell you something about John Kerry, or let me tell you something about Tom DeLay, and I'll say, okay, uh huh. And then you realize, you know, you know what the motivation is. <coughs> On the other hand, you can get a call from the Pentagon or the State Department, and they'll say, you know, what that general is saying before the committee is just not true. And I have documents that can demonstrate that. Then I think you're honor bound to vet those documents the best you can. But I take it another step. I think you also have to say information provided to NBC News by um, a, a official at the Defense Department uh, unhappy with the conduct of the Iraqi war. 
give a sense of the motivation of the person, not identify them because mm -hmm. they'll lose their job. But I, I think we have to be in a position where if we don't have access to everybody, and the First Amendment guarantees people have a right not to speak to us too. I mean, some people can say, I don't want to talk to you. That's their right. But if people want to talk to us, but are fearful of their lives or their careers, we need a vehicle to get that to us. The Federal Shield Law says basically that we would not have to divulge our sources if a prosecutor subpoenaed us. In this case, it may not apply because there's always an exception for national security. And that's the one thing about the um, Valerie Plain case that's so interesting is many of the judges who ruled on it, and one of the Court of Appeals judges uh, was appointed by President Clinton, said he's for a federal shield law, but he was voting to um, uphold the subpoena in this case because the special prosecutor provided a several page detailed memo uh, classified about national security. So maybe there's something deep there, but I, I just don't know. Well, as you said too, I mean, I think there's a responsibility on journalists end to make sure that what you're gonna report is, you, you're certain is, is accurate. I think one of the examples would, uh, Andrea Mitchell, for example, when she knew ahead of, uh, about John Kerry's running mate, but she sat on that and, and, and I guess vetted that through before, before going forward and saying, you know, NBC News has learned that well, you gotta so be so. careful. I mean, you can, you can get a tip saying, okay, you know, running mate's gonna be, well, the New York Post said Dick Gebhardt. <laughs> right. You know, they, Rupert Mur got, Murdoch got a hot tip and they put it on the front page. Uh, you've got to be very careful because there's a lot of people with agendas out there. Mm -hmm. And what you do, you know, you get a tip like, okay, it's going to be John Edwards. Then you call people you know and say, you know, look, I know it's Edwards. What time is it happening? And they'll say, oh, man, how'd you know that? And you say, well, that's, you know, that's what I do for a living. <laughs> <laughs> and you just keep collecting it all and finally you satisfy yourself that you have it cold. Because the worst thing in the world is you want to go out there and say it's going to be somebody and it's not. Right. And that's devastating. It's deadly. And you just can't make. But, but you know what? I also believe that if you make a mistake, we can't have a different standard for us, for journalists, than we have for politicians. I mean, if we're demanding accountability and, and for, you know, for vetting Supreme Court nominees or the war in Iraq or Social Security, if we make a mistake as a journalistic organization, we have to admit it. NBC Dateline had the story about trucks blowing up and they put a little igniter there and the president of NBC News, the executive producer, the correspondent, all got dismissed. CBS had, with Dan Rather, the whole tough situation. Every news organization goes through it. Jason Blair at the New York Times. Mm -hmm. And the only way to maintain your credibility and your integrity is step forward and say, we made a mistake, this is our correction, and we're pledging we won't do it again. And I think that enhances your credibility. But if you try to stonewall and spin like a politician, then I think you lose credibility quickly, and you should. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a few minutes left. If we can take a few questions from the audience. Hi. Um, How are you? Right, so Mr. Wheatley. Um, having worked at this for you uh, in 2004. Uh, Did I pay you? <laughs> Did I ever pay you? Uh, yes. Oh. Last Okay. <laughs> I, I, I came in having heard a lot, uh, and certainly my father uh, is in the industry as well, having heard lots of concept, uh, what I saw were misconceptions about a liberal bias in the, uh, in the media, and having worked at NBC for a summer, I, I completely agree that it's a misconception. Uh, everybody that I work with, you know, I come in, I'm not unbiased at all, and you know, I was told to can it with my political beliefs after two days. Um, so you put your Corona shirt on. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Imported beer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess my question is, do you feel that that's, that's an unfair label? Because I certainly, I certainly think that um, from what I call, recall watching during the Republican convention, it, 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 I'm a big NBC fan. I'm not such a big MSNBC fan. Uh -huh. uh, I, I can certainly recall watching Joe Scarborough, a Republican, interview Arnold Schwarzenegger, a Republican, about another Republican speech the day before. I, I personally feel that with this current administration, there's never been an administration that's been held more by the media. And you know, I, I've still heard a lot of people um, talk about, oh, well, the only reason Bush hasn't completely you know, blown, didn't completely blow Kerry out of the water was the liberal media. Do, do you feel that it, it's really a fair uh, statement to say that the media has a liberal bias here in 
I, well, yeah, okay. In saying that, I completely don't think that you have any bias. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I think the, the media is tough to define and describe. When, you know, when I grew up, it was ABC, CBS, NBC. That was it. You made an appointment with Uncle Walter or Chet and David. And, and now, with this explosion of 24-hour cable and blogs and everything else, so it's, it's difficult to categorize. But do I believe that the three network newses uh, are objective and fair and, and as free as bias as humanly possible? Yes. And do I think sometimes mistakes are made? Of course. Now, cable's a different variety. I mean, there are people on cable, they stand up and say, this is my opinion. The war is good, the war is bad. I'm a liberal, I'm a conservative, I'm a Democrat, I'm a Republican. But that's truth in advertising. I mean, everybody knows it. Everybody knows that Bill O'Reilly or Sean Hannity are conservatives. Alan uh, Combs is a liberal. Uh, and back and forth. And I think that's important. I think people should be, you know, analysts or commentators. But those of us, uh, whether it's Peter Jennings, God bless him, who's died, or Tom Brokaw, or, uh, Dan Rather, Bob Schieffer, myself, I mean, we try very, very hard to sift things through and make sure. I measure every word. If I say to someone is, a, you know, the conservative Republican Jesse Helms, then I'll say the liberal Democrat Ted Kennedy. You can't have one descriptive phrase for one party and not for the other. And, uh, uh, and I avoid words like reactionary and things like that. Cable, you, it doesn't. Um, newspapers, do they have an, a, an ideology of philosophy? Yes, particularly in the editorial page. The New York Times is a liberal editorial page. The Washington Post is a liberal editorial page. On the front page, however, you, I know those reporters. And they, you know, if anyone at the editorial page ever said to them, this is the way you're supposed to shape or cover that story, they'd say go to hell. But that's not what we do. Um, so everybody sees um, television through their own ideological prism. I will have George Bush or Bill Clinton on, and I'll ask the exact same questions. And in fact, in the 2000 election, I interviewed George Bush and Al Gore after each of the debates. I asked each of them the exact same questions for the Today Show, and the next day, I would get these emails saying, you left-wing pinko, you right-wing running dog. I said, I said, which one am I, you know? Because people see it through their own eyes. You know, they, want, they either want me to hug George Bush or choke him, or hug Bill Clinton or choke him. Well, I'm not going to do either, you know? And then I'd get an email from my mom, and I'd say, oh, this is, you were just wonderful. That's it. <laughs> yeah, you mentioned. So, so you, you, you know, you do your job, and, and sometimes, my, my, my view is simple. You learn as much as you can about your guest and his and her position on the issues and you take the other side. And you do that with Democrats and Republicans and people say, you know what, that's what you're paid to do. If you turn on cable, however, you know, and it's a different expectation. I mean, you, know, you should know what you're getting. And people do, they're pretty smart. Um, you mentioned Bob Schaefer, who I think at one point suggested you would be excellent to take over for on evening news. And people sometimes say, oh, you know, uh, Russell should follow Neil Shapiro as president. Is, Meet the press, your dream job? Yes. You're happy with, with the... There's nothing I'd rather do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, and, it, and I mean, don't think that I ever sat in my dad's lap back in Buffalo, you know, saying, you know, Dad, one day I'm going to be a moderator. <laughs> I mean, I didn't have a clue what I was going to do after high school, after college, after law school. But the one thing that I always had, and I, I couldn't encourage this more, was that I had a deep and abiding interest in government, public service in the country. And I, you know, I, I can be very skeptical, but I'm not jaded, I'm not cynical. And I know you have a lot of pressures on you to do well in your academic subjects and extracurricular activities, but I'm telling you, there's a whole world out there that is so desperate for your help and in, input. And these are real issues. The, I mean, the, you know, the war in Iraq is the real deal. The, the battle over how are we gonna pay for Katrina and how are we gonna pay for, the number of people on Social Security and Medicare is going to go from 40 million to 80 million in the next 15 years. The baby boom generation, my, my generation, we're getting old. And we hate to admit it, but we're going to, there's so many of us, you're going to have to pay for us. And you're either going to have to double the payroll tax or cut benefits by a third. It's all going to happen on your watch. The Patriot Act, what rights should we have in this, during the war on terror? What should we surrender? What do we need in order to go after the terrorist? And how much should we give up as individual citizens? This is, and, and being here in Boston, you know, right around the corner 
is the 2008 presidential election, right around the corner. All these candidates are going to pass through here going on their way to New Hampshire. Every, there are going to be eight Republicans and eight Democrats running. And if you have the time, I would read up on these candidates and get involved. Commit yourself to one of them or challenge them. Ask them questions. And, and, and don't settle just for, you know, vote for me and I'll set you free. Excuse me. What are you going to do? What are we going to do about Iraq? You know, how capable is, are, are the Iraqis going to step forward and spill blood for their own country? And if so, at what, what end? And where do we draw the line in terms of our involvement? Or with national service, the volunteer army, recruitment is down dramatically. And what does that mean? And in terms of national service beyond the Peace Corps or AmeriCorps, should it be mandatory? Or should it be voluntary as it is now? Or Social Security, Medicare, or taxes? Who should pay? Who should pay for more education grants and loans? Who should it be? And where should the money come from? And should the upper brackets, the more affluent, have their new tax cuts, or they should, should they be rolled back? These are big decisions. Huge, the environment, huge issue. If you, if you read what goes on in Louisiana, you can rebuild the city of New Orleans. And guess what? It's going to happen all over again. And it's not just the levees. It's the entire coastal region that has to be rebuilt, $15 billion. And it's heading here, every shore on, all around our country. There used to be a big debate about global warming, no more. No, Democrats and Republicans get it. They understand it. It's, it's scientifically proven. The avian flu, there's no, I mean, this thing could be hitting us this fall. The, there's real issues out there. And I just, you know, go on the internet, pick up a newspaper, turn on a, watch Meet the Press. <laughs> <laughs> but no, there, there, there's a, I, 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 imp, I beg you, get, get involved because we need citizens who really understand and appreciate our country and our nation and play a role in it. I remember a reading a, a restaurant review, and the critic was great. It said, you know, this restaurant has it all. It has great food, a great location, and great customers. That's exactly right. We have a great country. We have great issues. But we need great citizens. It's the only thing that makes it work. And we'll do our part to try to get the information to you. But it's of little value if you don't participate and vote and get engaged. I, I remember I went out to Iowa. And the Republicans had a Governor Ray out there, a moderate Republican. And some of the moderate Republicans came to me and said, you know, how could this have happened? The Christian conservatives have taken over our party. You've got to do something about it. And I said, excuse me? How is that my fault? I'm a journalist. Well, I said, well, explain to me what happened. Well, we had these meetings, and they showed up in large numbers. <laughs> oh, so it was a democracy. I see. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens. And so if you're concerned about the country being too liberal, the country being too conservative, guess what? It's your country. It's your country. And you can shape it in a way. I remember in New Hampshire in 2000, Democrats, Republicans, it's an open primary, so they can vote in either primary. John McCain blows it out, beats George Bush by 18 points. People couldn't believe it because people got together and said, you know what, this is what we want to do. They went down south in some of the states, Republican-only states, and, and Bush bounced back. But it's, uh, it is that vital, that critical. I mean, New Hampshire can be critical in launching a candidate, candidacy, and it can be very critical in eliminating candidacy. Only two or three people get their tickets punched out of New Hampshire. And I dare say if you had 1,000 students at BC working on a campaign, you could move it one way or the other. I absolutely believe that, having been in that state. Because it's a place where you can go door to door, you can retail it, and... Uh, End of sermon. I'll be here to cover it. Yeah. Are you going to bring the whiteboard back? The whiteboard, man. I, you know that white, I had a little whiteboard, Florida, 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 for those of you who are too young. Um, election night, 2000. Uh, uh, there's a perfect example. The networks got it wrong. We projected Florida for Gore, and then for Bush, and then for Gore, and then for Bush. And the computers were wrong. The models were wrong because of the turnout. The turnout was so big, we hadn't calculated it. It was a mistake, and we have to admit that. And we did, and we, got, we fixed it for the next time around. But I knew that the country was yearning for some kind of explanation. So I started writing on the back. My dad has a pad on his dresser where he pulls out a piece of paper and goes to the kitchen table and worked out his taxes and his mortgage and his tuition bills and his food bills. And you know, when my older sister wanted to get married, um, my brother-in-law now, 35 years, came and asked for a hand in marriage. And, I want to see it in black and white. How are you going to take care of my girl? I'm sitting there laughing like crazy. 
But he did. So that night, I, I could hear my dad's voice, you know, explain this to people. People don't remember the Electoral College fr from eighth grade. And so I said, you know, with Tom Brokaw, I said, this is the Electoral College. You need 270 electoral votes. And Bush has this many, and Gore has this many, and these are the undecided states, and how many electoral votes they have. And I kept crossing them off, and I finally turned to Tom. I said, Tom, Florida, Florida, Florida. Whoever wins Florida is the next president of the United States. It's that simple. And all the networks have pretty similar ratings. And the next day, they showed me this um, little calculation where when the, as, soon, as soon as the white board came out, the NBC ratings threw the roof, because it was the only thing people could understand. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's this little homespun comfort that people were coming around and galvanizing around. And I'm laughing because you know, we spent millions of dollars on these slick gadgets and chirons and computers, and I got this 695 little, <laughs> I actually had two, I had two of them. So we were up all night and I flew back to Washington and my uh, loving son was there and he said, Dad, you know, I really would like to have that board. I said, I can't tell you how touched I am that you would want a part of your dad's journalistic career. <laughs> I said, this means everything to me, this bonding father-son. And he said, you know what that thing's worth on eBay? <laughs> <laughs> ay, ay. <laughs> Big Russ's grandson, <laughs> yeah? the capitalist. <laughs> Who else? Other questions? Who's getting extra credit for coming here? <laughs> uh, I, you packed the house, Bonnie, huh? That's a thanks. <laughs> And it's Thirsty Thursdays, I'm told. You've got to leave it. Yeah? Yeah, I've been, afterwards, huh? This is your hydration? Oh, yeah, I see. Yeah. I've, been doing my re I've been doing my research, you see? Yeah. Uh, um, you talked about how uh, media should press for certain issues. Do you feel like there's a point where journalism goes too far? Like, they really should just stop? Yeah, I don't think you should have an agenda. I don't, you know, it's not our job to say, uh, you know, this is an issue that you must be put on the, on the, uh, in the political debate. But if a candidate is going through a whole campaign and never talking about the deficit or never talking about the Iraq war, then we have an obligation to ask them. And so it's not our agenda. It's issues that are important to the American people that you try to get answers to. Uh, there are crusading journalists that will take an expose on senior citizens' homes, things like that, and I think that's very legitimate. I do think where we have to be very careful is with a people who are grieving. And it's more on the local level than the national level, but we can be just as responsible or culpable. And this goes back to my point where people do not have an obligation to talk to you. And many times when there's a, a tragedy and you see a, you know, 50 TV crews and trucks, satellite trucks outside a house, people can't come out because they, they're going to be accosted. Uh, I have said, you know, is, isn't there a way we could do a pool, just have one camera out there with a reporter, um, and if they want to come out and talk, so be it. If not, if they're grieving, let them grieve. Let them have their moments as a family. And, um, you know, some people disagree with that, but I, I think that's important because I, 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 think, I, I, I think you could be an aggressive and good journalist and still be a good human being with manners, that civility very important. I wish we had more of it in our politics, frankly. And I think current television probably encourages politicians being less civil, and that bothers me an awful lot. I used to watch Hubert Humphrey, the great liberal, debate Barry Goldwater, the great conservative, and then go off and have a drink together and try to reach common ground and consensus. And now politicians flee to the TV gallery and attack each other some more. They don't know each other very well. They communicate through sound bites as opposed to sitting across the table. But I, I, if there's one area that stirs me most, it's, it's, it's interfering with people who have encountered tragedy. And uh, if you ever have had the uh, horrible experience of death or tragedy in your family, <coughs> you really understand it and I think become much more sensitive to, to the need to just to, to be alone for a while. I think we can take one or two more questions. Do you think that Helen Myers will be confirmed? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I don't know. Um, it is quite interesting watching this reaction. Yeah, I wanted to add, add another Go ahead. to that, please. I know how do you think the media will cover this? Yeah. You guys pay for your time to fill this immensely of sending everything that you have to Donald Trump with money meetings. Yep. Judge George Will had, had an editorial today. Yes, he did. 
he was on Rush Limbaugh's show. So I'm just wondering, how do you see the media playing the coverage of that? Oh, very aggressively and completely, as you can see so far. Yeah. Uh, it's been quite interesting seeing the reaction in conservative circles. You mentioned Rush Limbaugh. Peggy Noonan has a piece in the Wall Street Journal. Uh, George Will, conservatives, who are quite upset by the appointment. Uh, they, uh, some because they don't think that um, she has the legal background and standing, others because they don't think that uh, there are other conservative jurists who would be more experienced and more capable, others because they don't know enough about her and don't know whether they can trust her, quote unquote, on the court. Will he, she be another David Souter or Anthony Kennedy? I think that the <coughs> hearings will be critical for her. The one thing that John Roberts was able to demonstrate at his hearings was that whether you agreed with him or not in his judicial philosophy, he was someone who understood constitutional law and was steeped in it. And, um, and that's why he got 78 votes. Um, I think uh, Ms. Myers is going to have a very high standard, one, to show a grasp of constitutional law and the nuances thereof. Uh, but also uh, demonstrate uh, an, an, an ability of judicial temperament that people don't have any idea because she's never been a judge. We've had a lot of people on the court uh, who do not have judicial backgrounds. Earl Warren was the governor of California, to name one. Uh, but uh, her background is, is it was not in terms of a public official. It's much more limited than that. The president has endorsed her emphatically. Uh, you see now a, a steady stream of articles coming from Nathan Hecht, a judge in Texas, who, who her sometimes um, escort, I guess you could say, uh, who's out giving interviews saying that she attended Right to Life rallies with, her, with him, and she took on the ABA to change her position on abortion, giving hints as to what her personal views might be. But I, I think it's, um, uh, it's wide open right now, and I just don't know, and I don't think anyone knows. And I, I know the White House is quite surprised by the intensity of the conservative opposition. Uh, and, it's, and I think the hearings are absolutely critical for her. I do. Yeah. Um, I know you've interviewed essentially all of the influential people and newsmakers of our, of our time, but is there anyone you haven't gotten to talk to that you're just dying to sit down with? Well, my biggest disappointment was, in, uh, was Pope John Paul II because I have a letter uh, promise in writing, uh, promising an interview with him, and then it never happened. And that all was a result of, um, I'll give you an example of, in terms of trying to be a dogged journalist. When I first started out at NBC, I was an executive in New York behind the scenes working with the Today Show. Bryant Gumbel and, and Jane Pauley were on then. And they had fallen in second place in the hotly competitive uh, breakfast TV wars. And I had the idea of <coughs> taking the show on the road. When I was a little boy, I used to watch the flickering black and white TV set with J. Fred Muggs and Dave Garraway. And, and we have the technology now to go anywhere. And I said to Steve Friedman, the executive producer, you know, let's take the show on the road. He said, where? I said, well, I think maybe in the spring, Italy, the food, the fashion, the art, the culture, the vibrancy. I said, if we time our trip right, we can get behind the walls of the Vatican. Catholics and non-Catholics would be intrigued. And Friedman said, good idea, get the Pope. I said, get the Pope. I said, Friedman in my church, it's a big deal. You know, I, I used to be an altar boy, but there are a few steps in between. I like, <laughs> so I sat down and wrote this letter to the Pope, you know, and sent it off and heard nothing back. And I was sitting in, in church going, oh, my God, this is going to be, I mean. So I called my dad. And he said, what are, you, what are you working on? I said, well, I'm trying to get the Pope. <laughs> he said, write him a letter in Polish. I said, oh, my God, that's genius. Dad, that's right, you're right. So I took the letter and faxed it to our Warsaw Bureau and had to translate it into Polish. The next time I saw in the paper that John Cardinal Kroll of Philadelphia had been appointed to a high-level Vatican commission, he's of Polish descent, and he knew Karol Wojtyla of Krakow, Poland when he was a young priest. When he came to the United States, he would stay in the rectory with him the whole bit. So I called Cardinal Kroll, I said, can I come see you on a matter of some urgency? And I walked in his office and I showed him this letter in Polish. He said, this is written in perfect Polish. I said, yes. You know. He said, are you Polish? And I was wondering if I could get one by. I said, uh, no, I'm from Buffalo. Some of my best friends are. <laughs> and he said, would, what would you like me to do? I said, I'd like you to bring this letter to Rome and share it with the Holy Father. His phone rang. He said, um, would you like to come to the cathedral and listen to the Archdiocese and Boys Choir of Philadelphia prepare for Christmas? And I said, 
there's nothing I'd rather do, Your Eminence, than listen to those little cherubs. So <laughs> off I went. And they were filling the rafters. They, yeah, they were terrific. And he said to me, you know, Mr. Russell, my dream is to one day have these young men sing for the Holy Father. I said, <laughs> now I know why you're a cardinal. <laughs> I said, of course. So I took, took the letter and quickly amended it to say if His Holiness accepted NBC's invitation, we would be accompanied by who else? The Archdiocese and Boys Choir of Philadelphia. <laughs> so he went to Rome. He called me about two weeks later. He said, would you please come to Rome? I have shared this letter with the Holy Father and his top advisors, and they would like to meet you and become convinced of your good intentions. And so I flew to Rome and worked your way through the bureaucracy, which is, you can imagine what it was like, days upon days of meeting different levels. And finally, I was led into a room about this size, it was empty, but for myself, and suddenly the doors opened in the back, and there dressed in white was the Pope, John Paul II. And as I began to walk towards him, uh, you heard this tough, no-nonsense, hard-hitting moderator of Meet the Press begin the conversation by saying, bless me, Father. <laughs> <laughs> he said, you are the man for from NBC called Timothy. I said, I am your guy. No, no, no. Don't forget this face. I, stay with me on this one. And he said, they tell me you're a very important man at the network. I said, your holiness, you know, with all due and deep respect, there's only two of us in this room. I'm a most distant second. He put his hands on my shoulders, smiled from ear to ear, eyes twinkling, and said, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they agreed. And so we brought the Today Show over there, and uh, it was an amazing week. And 10 hours of programming, two hours a day. And then um, the Pope said a private mass for us, and then he came out and agreed to be wired and talk. And Brian Gumbel, who happens to be Catholic, I said, Brian, you know, this is different than uh, presidents and governors and senators and kings and queens. You'll feel something. And, uh, and being in his presence, he said, oh, I don't, you never lack in confidence. I can handle this, too, you know. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, he walks out and goes, Your Holiness, these are pictures of my children. Would you please bless them? <laughs> and J Jane Pauling said, I have twins. I said, I have twins. <laughs> so uh, I, after that, I, I followed up with a letter saying, you know, this went so well. I would now like to, I've now taken over this program called Meet the Press, and I'd like to come sit with you and talk about the church and its future, and particularly the American church and what's going on here and how you see American Catholicism. And I got this letter back saying, you know, His Holiness accepts your invitation and we'll work out the details. And months turned to years, it never happened. But uh, it's my one regret, and it was a big regret too, because I think it would have been good for our church. I, I know you have the church for the 21st century here. I was part of a, one of those sessions. I think it's so important that people who are in our country and who, who have grown up Catholic and have a real understanding and love of our faith, have an ability to be able to talk to the Pope and to other people in the hierarchy and get a sense of what they're, they're thinking. But uh, it's difficult, as you know. Yeah. Uh, how the brothers trying to escape the Vatican? Do you, do you guys shy away from Philly? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was, we were high on them, I'm telling you. I thought this was it. it you know, they're going to play Kelly Holcomb on uh, Sunday. They're going to start Kelly Holcomb. We tried Blue Bl Drew Bledsoe after we got him from the Patriots. That didn't work. He's now down in Dallas. But the Patriots have lost two games, so something's going on. You know, what, the, what is that about? But I, the Bills are going to have a – but, you know, as Big Russ says about Buffalo Bills fans, they never die because they won't die until the Bills win the Super Bowl. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, how about the ACC? Isn't that a lot of fun? I'll tell you. It's Florida State. We had that game. Had the game won. Just got away. Beat Clemson. Going to beat Virginia? Yes. Yeah. And then Duke comes here February 1st, Duke basketball? That's a night. That is a night. I know someone in this, uh, Dick Vitale, right, is going to be here? I know someone in this room who has a T-shirt with Dick Vitale dressed in a Duke cheerleaders outfit, but I'm not, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who it is, but you might see it on ESPN. On <laughs> Anything else? you got to study. Come on. It's midterms, huh? These, well, thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you That's very it. much. All right.